Good morning. Welcome to Study the Word. This is brought to you by the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. We're glad you've joined us today. In just a few moments, we're going to spend time dealing with a Bible question. That's what this program is all about. If you're new to this program, you're going to notice a phone number come up at the bottom of your screen through throughout today's telecast. When you see that number, folks, it's for you to call and to submit a Bible question that we would deal with on this program. You can also use that phone number to contact us when we offer other free Bible study helps, which we will mention at the end of our program. But we're glad you've joined us, and now we need to get into this week's Bible question. Actually, this question started over three weeks ago, because there are five parts to the answer to this question. The question at hand is, what is Calvinism? And if you're not familiar with Calvinism, you might be wondering, is this even a Bible question? Is that like somebody asking, what time is it? No, Calvinism is something that we need to deal with because a lot of religious groups of our day um, believe parts of Calvinism. And when I mean believe parts of Calvinism, John Calvin came up with his theory. And in answering this false teaching, we pointed out that there are five aspects to it, and what we've been doing is we've been dealing with um, each one of them every week. We're in our fourth week. The first week when we started answering the question, what is Calvinism, we pointed out, well, John Calvin taught that you are born in sin. We dealt with that three weeks ago. If you missed that program and you want to know what the Bible teaches about being born in sin, how that we're not, I know many people teach that we are, but if you would like a copy of that program, just note that phone number and give us a call. We save these on DVD, so all you need is a DVD player. It's free and you can request that program. The second part of Calvinism that we dealt with was unconditionally elected. John Calvin and others like him believe that God just unconditionally chooses who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. And we expose that false doctrine. And again, you can request that program. The third week we spent talking about limited atonement. Again, part of Calvinism. How that they teach that Jesus did not die for the whole world. He did not shed his blood for the lost. He only shed his blood for the saved, which is not true. It's not in harmony with the scriptures, but they teach that his blood was limited. That's why they call it limited atonement. And today, we're going to deal with yet another one. Now, what we have explained in programs past is that a good way to remember these five false doctrines of Calvinism is to remember the name TULIP, because each letter in the name TULIP helps you to remember each of the doctrines. The T repre represented total depravity, which means born in sin. The U, unconditionally elected. The L, limited atonement. And today, the letter I, in pointing out what is Calvinism? Irresistible grace. They come right out and say that you cannot resist the grace of God. Well, I understand why they believe that, because if you're going to teach point number two, which if you're unconditionally elected, that God has already decided whether you're going to heaven or hell, but I guess it makes sense to teach that, that, that you cannot resist God's grace then, because if he's chosen you to go to heaven, you're going to heaven whether you want to or not. And so it might logically make sense and fit into the theory, but it's a false premise. And so we're going to expose the, um, this false doctrine of irresistible grace. And just in a moment we're going to deal with that, but I just want to remind you that you can request this whole series. They're just five uh, DVDs, no cost to you, and you can sit down and just um, go through this study in the comfort of your own home and just have them for future reference or send them to a friend. You know, we've had people call up and say, you know, I know some people who believe you're born in sin. Can I have a copy 
of that lesson, I'd like to send it to them. Okay, having said that, okay, irresistible grace. What are we talking about? Well, grace means, you know, something that we, we don't deserve. God gives us something we don't deserve. It's, it's unmerited, unearned. We are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 clearly tells us this. Faith is our part, an active, obedient faith. Grace is God's part. He sent His Son to die for us. But is it irresistible? Can we resist the grace of God? Now, they claim to teach that we can't. Why would they teach that? Well, let's look at some of the verses that they present and, and we'll deal with them because if they're found in the Bible, we obviously have to give an answer. Now, over in the book of John is where they will turn to. and We're going to read uh, verses 37 and 44 of John uh, chapter 6. And here's what Jesus says. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Okay? And then you move down to verse 44. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. And so what Jesus is talking about here is the confidence that, you know, the Father has given certain ones to Jesus, and, of course, that verse 44 is their key passage. No one comes to the Father unless, or comes to me, rather, unless the Father draws him. So what they're saying is that you can't resist. If, if God draws you, then, then how are you going to say no to that? You're just going to be pulled in, and, and you can't resist the grace of God. Well, that's not what these verses are talking about, folks. You know, when I consider what he's talking about here, you know, these verses do not tell you how. How does the Father draw them in? That's the, that's the question that really needs answering. I don't deny the, the fact that when Jesus clearly stated here that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him, but how does the daughter, Father do that? Well, you know because of what they taught um, in their theory about unconditionally elected, they're saying that God draws them by just picking and choosing. No, that's, that's not what the Word of God says. If we turn over to the New Testament, to the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, we read in verse 14, as Paul writes to these Christians, he said, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, what Paul is saying is that you're called by the gospel. How does the Father draw people to Jesus? through his message. This is why we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Romans 1.16, the power unto salvation is the gospel. And if it isn't the word, then are, are, are they, what, they, what they're saying is that no, no, the Father's just going to mystically or miraculously just draw these people uh, to Jesus and the Father's responsible for it. And so they're saying you don't have any say in the matter. That's why the God's grace is irresistible. And we're saying, no, no, no. Now, you can resist the grace of God. And we're going to read passages that comes right out and states that. But we're going to point out the error in their thinking in the passages that they use to, to justify it. And so that's just not going to work. Well, another passage that they like to, to bring up is over in John chapter 10. And we'll read verse 16. And again, Jesus is talking. He says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Again, we have a text that, that says nothing about irresistible grace, which is what they want us to believe. Um, all this has to do with is, is what will be done. It doesn't talk about the how. We've already been dealing with the how and how that our Lord calls us by the message, go out and teach people, and the power is found within the word. Either people will accept it or they will reject it. But we don't like that idea. Calvin didn't like that idea that people have the ability to accept it or reject it. It's almost in his mind that so that limits the power of God. It doesn't limit the power of God. And they're saying, well, if somebody can resist God's grace, then, then that limits what God is able to do. Well, no. 
Um, that would be true if there were no consequences. But since there are consequences to resisting God's grace, if there, is, if there are consequences to resisting the message of God, God's still in control. You know, is a parent, is a parent out of control when they, and they have no control over their children if they tell their child to do something and they don't do it? Say, well, what do you mean? Well, does that mean they're out of control? They say, well, apparently they are. No, 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 the parent's still in control. If they discipline the child, if they punish the child by, you know, maybe taking their uh, cell phone away from them, they ground them, and they take away certain privileges. See, the parent is still in control. They exercise their authority. So it's, it's just not right to think just because somebody can resist God's grace that God doesn't have any power. Of course God has power. But man has the ability to choose. And that's what these verses are just telling us, that you know some choose to follow. Some come because none of those verses tell us how they are drawn, how they follow the Lord. They just tell us what they do. And what are these people doing that he mentioned in the last couple of passages? What they are doing is they are following the Lord. They are listening to Christ's voice. Why are they doing that? It is their choice. Calvin and others want us to think, no, God makes that happen. No, no, he doesn't force it upon them. Man has free will. Let's go to Acts 16, another passage that is often used to, do, to defend this false doctrine of irresistible grace. And this is the conversion of Lydia when she was hearing the gospel preached. And you can read about this in Acts, the 16th chapter. But I'm just going to notice verse 14 for the sake of time this morning. He says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. They were preached. Um, the word of God was being preached to them. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. He said, The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So they'll look at this and, see, and, say, and say to themselves, well, the Lord opened it. The Lord forced her heart open. The Lord made her receive the word. No, not at all. What this passage is doing is just simply giving credit where credit is due. When you preach the word of God, there's no power in the person who's, who's listening. You know, the power is not within their ear. The power is here, as Paul mentioned. I mentioned it already, Romans 1.16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. This word of God is powerful. As we have often illustrated, the sun which is in heaven, or in the sky rather. You know, we think about the sun that is up there. The sun, as hot as it is, we know that it can melt butter. But it also can turn clay as hard as a rock as it sucks the moisture out of it. And so you have the same sun, two different results. And that's really what can happen with the Word of God. It can melt the hearts of individuals, or it can become as hard as stone. People have the abilities to either accept it or reject it. When people do not believe it, then that is their choice. But what happens when a person does believe it, like Lydia? Well, we can say the Lord opened her heart. Well, how did the Lord open it? Through the Word. Lydia had the... Uh, the ability to listen to the message and to choose whether it is right or whether it is wrong. There's no, none of the verses that we have read so far says anything about irresistible grace of God. And I find that interesting because in a moment I'm going to be showing you some verses where it comes out and says they did resist. They actually uses the word. It's interesting how that you have uh, this whole doctrine such as unconditionally elected and limited atonement and now irresistible grace, all these terms, they're not even found in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Yet people believe it and they follow it. And that's a shame. So what we're trying to do is answering the question today, if you just tuned in, what is Calvinism? And we're showing that it's, it's a theory, it's a bunch of doctrines that have been accumulated and into this theory, that is false. And what we're doing is we're testing it by the Word of God. That's what we're told to do over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1.
Test the spirits to see whether they are of God or not. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, what are we going to use as a test? It has to be the Word. We need a standard to test it by. If you don't have a standard, then you can never know if something is right or wrong. Ever. And so we're thankful that we have the Word. Okay, now having said that, I want us to talk a little bit about some of the reasoning that the Calvinist use in accepting irresistible grace. And um, again, we get this idea, um, just because there are things that are out of man's control, it doesn't mean he can't control anything. You see, that's, that's the point. We need to get that. that that's their reasoning. Um, just when we think about the idea earlier, when we talked about the parent and the child, you know, we're still in control of things because a parent can discipline. Now, since they're thinking this idea of that man has no free will, what we want to do now is to spend a little bit of time looking at some passages in the Bible which clearly tells us that there is free will. Now remember, if you can't resist the grace of God, then there's no problem. So, if God's grace comes upon you, and you are obedient, then, then everything is fine. You don't have any say in the matter, but the point is you do. In Galatians chapter 1, this is a passage that you have to ask yourself, that if Calvinism is true, how do you explain Galatians chapter 1, verse 6? Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. And he tells the brethren this. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So these brethren had been called. How were they called? Well, according to the Calvinists, they would say that the Father drew them into the Son. And uh, they didn't have any say in the matter. Well, let's see if they're going to be consistent. So these people came to the Lord, to the grace of Christ. Remember it says he called you into the grace of Christ. They said, well, see, they, they couldn't resist it. They were called into the grace of Christ. But Paul said here, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. You've turned your back. You received the grace of Christ, and now you've gone and listened to somebody else teach false doctrine. Why are you doing that? I, he's, I marvel that you're doing that. That's, it's just not right. It's unacceptable. But wait a second. If Calvin and others like him are right, and they're thinking that you can't resist the grace of God, then why is Paul rebuking these people? Why rebuke these Christians for turning away if God is responsible for it? See, because they're saying that, that you can't resist the grace of God, which also means that you can't even come to God, you can't even obey, unless God is the one that makes you. And so, if you're one of the ones that God has chosen that's not going to be saved, all the studying in the world is not going to help you because you just, you, you don't have God changing you. Folks, it's just not logical, it doesn't make sense, and we need to see through it. It's powerful. Alright, let's look at a, at a few others. Over in the book of Acts, when Stephen stood up and he was preaching this long sermon to these Jews that had gathered there that day, and we find out that they were not really interested in what he had to say. Um, they were kind of getting upset with him. And he says in verse 51 to these people, he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. And as he continued to preach, we find out that these people, look at verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They didn't want to listen to what Stephen had to say. They didn't want to listen. But did you notice verse 51? You've resisted. The Holy Spirit's role was to reveal the message, and, and of course, Stephen was preaching the word and, and he was telling them about what their fathers did. In verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming one, the just one, Jesus. 
You know, what were the prophets doing? The prophets were just teaching people the message that God gave them to give to the people. And the people back then, the Old Testament times, which Stephen is talking about, they resisted, they rejected, and they killed. I thought you can't resist the grace of God. Yes, you can. And he told them, you stiff-necked. He's blaming them. Well, listen, if God is the one that's responsible for people accepting or rejecting, then why is Stephen rebuking these people? They would be sitting there saying, well, look, we can't resist the grace of God. If we're part of the chosen, we're not going to come to God. And if we're part of the chosen, we will come to God. But it's not our, it's not our fault. God has already decided it. So why are you blaming us, Stephen? And the reason Stephen is blaming them is because irresistible grace is a false doctrine. It's not something you find within the Word of God. And this is the problem we have today. A lot of people are teaching things and believing things that are not biblically based. And that's what this program is all about. And so you call up questions and, and you leave them and we see what the Bible has to say. And perhaps you want something considered. Maybe you attend somewhere and you say, well, you know what? I, I've heard our preacher teach this and where our church goes, they teach this, or where I go to church rather. And I want to know, is this biblically based? And what does the Bible have to say about it? The best thing to do is just ask and we'll open up the scriptures. If the Bible is silent about it, I may have to just come on this program and say, here's the question, and the Bible is silent about it. For example, if somebody were to call in and say, you know, I was reading 2 Corinthians, and Paul talked about having a thorn in the flesh. What was it? I don't know, the Bible is silent. It could have been his eyesight. Some people speculate about that. Um, the poor health that he had. We just don't know, the Bible is silent. We need to respect that. But there are other times when the Bible does tell us some things, and that's what we do. We, we just see what the Bible has to say about it. Okay. So, let's go over to Acts, the fifth chapter. And again, we're dealing with this idea, can we resist the, resist the grace of God? When God provides the, the, the message that is there, can we accept it or reject it on our own? Or is it God that has to step in and say, no, I'm going to make you accept it because it's irresistible. No, it is resistible is the point that we're making. In Acts chapter 5, verse 1, we find that there was a problem with the early church. This is the first sin within the local congregation, and it's centered around money. Verse 1 says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? You lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, I can't resist the Holy Spirit. I can't lie unless God makes me. No. These people were held accountable. You know, it's funny. Of all the doctrines we've talked about so far within this, this uh, theory of Calvinism, the four points, so far we got one more to talk about next week. And we hope you'll be back for that is that this is one of those points where the Bible is just full of examples over and over and over where people were being rebuked for rejecting God. And yet the very doctrine of Calvinism says you cannot resist the grace of God. You can resist the grace of God. It's a choice. Matter of fact, when you talk about grace, and let's look at it. I mentioned it a moment ago in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, Let's talk about this, how, how, how this grace comes about. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says in verse 8, for by, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, let's just stay here. What is it about the grace of God that we need to learn? It's a gift of God. A gift. Have you ever given anybody a gift? You know, that person, when you offer them a gift, they either accept it or they reject it. That's why it's a gift. Now, if something that's forced upon somebody, you know, and they have no say in the matter. Now, people might come back and say, well, Chuck, God sent his son and people had no say in the matter. Well, that's true. 
But just because they had no say in the matter doesn't mean they have no say at all. You know, you didn't get to choose your parents, did you? No, I didn't get to choose. My mom and dad, they just had me. Okay, so since you didn't get to choose who your parents are, do you have a choice whether you'll be a parent? Of course. Just because you don't have a say in one thing doesn't mean you don't have a say in another thing. That's the problem. That's where the theory breaks down. Is they want to go right across the board here. And so when you start thinking about the idea that, that uh, God has given us His grace, and it's the gift of God, can it be rejected? Well, of course it can. Well, then, well, God forced His Son on the whole world. I've heard some people say, I didn't ask God to send His Son. Well, that's true. You, he, you didn't ask God, but you need to be thankful that He did. Well, God did that for you even though you didn't ask. I know that's true. But just because God did something like that, and you didn't have a choice in the matter, doesn't mean you don't have a choice in anything. And you do. You have a choice to either accept Jesus or, uh, died for you and you need to be a follower of Him, or not. And folks, it's been perfectly clear that there's so many problems with Calvinism. Now the last one that we're going to talk about, Lord willing, next week, and we hope you'll tune in next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, set your DVR, because in the word tulip, the last letter is the word, is the letter P, and it represents perseverance of the saints, which means once saved, always saved. There is that false doctrine that's out there in the world even today that teaches once you become a Christian, you can never fall away and lose your soul. People teach this. What's the Bible have to say about it? Well, we'll look at that next week. We'll look at the passages. If you want a copy of today's program, next week's or this whole series, just five in all, of answering the question, what is Calvinism? Please request that. You see that phone number. We want to thank you folks for taking time out of your busy day to study the scriptures with us. If you like to study the Word, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, turn on your radio, 1400 a.m. We have a live radio program called Study the Word, just like this, and you can call in your Bible questions, and we deal with Bible questions just like this TV program. So if you like this format, you're going to enjoy the radio program. So every Sunday at 2 o'clock, 1400 a.m., you can listen to it. Now, if you're out of the Newburgh Evansville area, go to our website, riverridgechurch.org, and you can listen to our radio program through the internet. But you have to go on at 2 o'clock and go to our website and click on listen to our radio program. And there it is, just as clear as this TV uh, broadcast. If you'd like to enroll in a free home Bible study course, we offer that. You can take it through the mail. Just send us uh, or give us your name and address when you call that number. Leave it on voicemail. If you have a chance to worship with us, the River Ridge Church meets at 3 Sharon Place, right in the heart of Newburgh. We want to thank you folks for once again being with us today. And as you've been learning, we need to make sure that we study the scriptures to find out what is right and what is wrong. Have yourselves a great day. Thank you for watching.